Howdy folks and welcome to another episode of Workshop Wednesday and in this episode we're going to be finishing off the M3 Lee with the crew and the diorama build. Uh, sticking out of the turret you can see one of the original crew that came with it. I have no idea how Rita managed to find it. I've painted it up, it hasn't been varnished yet, it's a bit crappy. So, we can definitely do better than this guy. Oh yes, I had to cut his legs off to get him to fit inside the turret. Um, yes, I know there should be a machine gun turret on top, but screw him. Instead, I've gone out and gotten this. Hang on a second, let's just move the tank out of the way so we can get it in shot. There you go, US ammo loading tank crew from Miniart. Way better. And the thing that I like about this is no two crewmen are the same. Some of them are wearing tankers coveralls, some of them aren't, some of them are wearing gaiters, some of them are wearing putties. Not all of them have dust goggles, uh, and obviously the poses are also different. Now, they recommend exactly which colours to use for which parts based on which brand of paints you're using. And of course, they provide this information for everything other than Citadel, <laughs> which is what I mostly have. Uh, so I'm pretty much going to be making this up as I go along. Now, here's my first mistake. As you can see, I've already primed these figures on the sprues. A couple of episodes back, several of you suggested, since it was quite hard to get into all the nooks and crannies on the various different Imperial Guardsmen I was painting, why don't you just paint them on the sprues? And I thought at the very least, priming them on the sprues would be a really good idea. It's not. It's an absolutely terrible idea for a whole bunch of reasons. But of course I had to find out the hard way. At first it does seem like a really good idea because you can get a good proper paint coverage of all the various different bits of the figures and pieces of the model and then once the paint job is done you can snip them off the sprues, glue them together and bingo, a perfect painted model. Except it doesn't actually work like that in practice. First, all of those bits of plastic that actually attach the pieces of model to the plastic sprue, I believe the industry term for them is gates. When you cut those off, you're left with an unpainted and unprimed bit. Now a lot of those gates are positioned so that they're on parts that are going to be glued to another part of the model anyway, but not all of them are. Some of them, for example, are attached to the top of somebody's helmet. So you end up with an unpainted spot, which you have to do again, and almost certainly isn't going to match what you've done to the rest of the model. And that's a best case scenario because you're probably going to have to sand that bit down as well because there's almost certainly going to be an unwanted bit of plastic sticking up where you cut it off. So now you've got an even bigger unpainted spot because you've just sanded off all the paint around the area that needed sanding down. Then of course you've got mould lines which also need to be sanded down so you can kiss goodbye to the paint on and around those as well. Now I haven't fully painted these figures. I've only primed them. Even so, I'm going to have one hell of a problem getting these guys stuck together. Because the way plastic cement glue works is it actually melts the surface of the plastic that you apply it to. And then when you attach another piece of plastic to it, the two melt together and when they dry out they form a solid bond. It's extremely good for gluing plastic to plastic and not much good for anything else. And one of the many other things that it's not very good at is gluing paint to paint. If you've got something that is covered in paint and you're trying to glue it to something else that is covered in paint, then plastic cement is extremely good at turning that paint into a sort of mushy, streaky paste that doesn't really stick to anything. So these are all kinds of reasons why painting or even priming your models while they're still on the plastic sprue sounds like a good idea in theory, but is an absolutely terrible thing to do in practice. Now, of course, I found all of this out the hard way when I tried to glue these guys together, and it just didn't work. I ended up resorting to a combination of super glue and modelling putty, <laughs> which worked eventually, but the results were suboptimal. Still, lesson learned, I won't be doing this again in a hurry. So, yeah, my attempt to save a bit of time by priming them when they were all still on the sprue ended up causing a lot more trouble than it was worth. And painting the crew was a real pain in the arse because of it. But I got them done, and then it was time to move on to the diorama. And this is what I'm going to be using. This is actually made from clay, and 
I didn't build it. Although I do have the materials required to build my own dioramas from scratch, and I'm going to be trying that in the future, but for the moment I saw this and I thought, this looks amazing. So I snapped it up, primed it with some of this uh, ultra matte brown plastic coat acrylic spray, which I picked up from a hardware store, and now I have to actually get the thing properly painted. Now what you definitely don't want to be doing is using your extremely expensive acrylic model paints to coat something as big as this because it will cost you an absolute fortune in paint. What I am going to do is use some of this Citadel Dried Brown, add a little bit of uh, Citadel Abaddon Black, and an absolute shit ton of water. I mean, we're talking 75% water, 25% paint. And I'm going to use a scenery brush, although for this kind of work, any old brush will do. doesn't matter whether it's natural or synthetic. It just needs to be big, because there's going to be a lot of coverage and we're just going to slap this stuff on pretty much all over. I realise it sounds as if I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever done anything like this. I'm not going in completely blind, you know, the way I would have been if I'd been doing this 30 years ago, before the internet. Uh, I've watched plenty of landscape modelling videos on YouTube, there's two in particular who stand out. One goes by the name of Luke's APS. I'll put links down below in the video description to their various YouTube channels. And Luke specializes in building landscape model scenery. He does it very quickly, he does it very effectively, and he does it using all of his own stuff, which he also happens to sell online. So his videos uh, not only show you how to do it, but also serve as extremely effective advertising for the stuff he sells that he actually uses in his builds on YouTube. There's another fella, he's another Luke, um, Luke Towen, an Australian, who is sickeningly good at making model landscape scenery. Unlike the previous Luke, this guy doesn't just do the landscapes, he also does the buildings, the roads, the street lights. Uh, seriously, he is absolutely incredible. Well anyway, while I was slapping this stuff on, I had a visitor. Somebody was very interested in what it was I was up to, and appeared to want to help. <laughs> What's this, Nakazuki? <clears throat> Nakazuki? Nakazuki? No! <laughs> no, baby! <laughs> What's going on? Hey! I know it's very interesting. <laughs> you, you don't want to get any of this on your fur. Come on, baby. Yeah. While Akazuki's kind offer of help was very much appreciated, I really wasn't looking forward to having to give her a bat afterwards to get all of the paint out of her fur. So, she didn't like it, but I was forced to remove her from the work desk. So, I picked her up, turned around, put her down, turned back to the work desk, Next thing I know, she's occupied my seat. What are you going to do? She sees me doing something she wants to take part. I'm just not entirely sure that her fine motor skills are up to the delicate art of scale modelling. I mean, she's definitely up for it. I'm, I'm just not convinced she has what it takes. Come on, you. That's my seat. Well, anyway. With Akazuki's kind assistance, or perhaps despite Akazuki's kind assistance, I managed to get the wash of the base completed. And while that's drying out, and it is going to take a while to dry out, here's a little something I'm going to add to the diorama. Allied road signs of World War II. Again, these are by Miniart, same as the, uh, the tank crew. These guys just seem to specialise in doing a whole bunch of different kinds of accessories for model kits and dioramas, and they are very, very good. They're also not particularly expensive, so I'm going to be using some of these. Not quite sure which ones yet, although I do know I don't want them to be pointed to any specific places so you can tie down exactly where the diorama is supposed to be set, so the signs to Cologne and Carentown, for example, are a no-go. So while I'm figuring out which ones I want to use, and since the base has now dried out, we're going to start applying some detail to things like the uh, roots and logs. We're going to get the rocks painted up. I'm not quite sure what colour to paint the rocks. I mean, normally when you see a diorama, the rocks tend to be painted in grey and then washed in black, and that tends to do a pretty good job. But 
Do I want to do sandstone rocks? Do I want to do granite? Do I want to do limestone? I, I don't know. I suppose it's a question of what's going to look best against this muddy, dark earth, almost World War I battlefield looking background. Although there's going to be some greenery added to this as well, but I suppose the only way to really know is to maybe do some test rocks in different colours and just see how they look. So the first thing I'm going to do is get the rocks undercoated in Wraithbone. This is a sort of very, very pale, creamy, sort of dirty off white. And then we'll apply some washers in different colours and see which one looks the best. Bottom right corner you can see my first experiment. That's a Citadel contrast paint, Gore Grunter Fur. It's brown, obviously. Uh, it's very shiny at the moment because it's still wet. And it's not terrible. But I'm not convinced I want all of the rocks in that colour. Next I'm going to have a stab with a lighter shade of brown. This is Seraphim Sepia. It's one of Citadel's range of shade paints. Let's see how this looks. Can't see at the moment. Obviously my hand's in the way. Well, I think it looks better than the rock painted in the contrast paint. But it's still not the look I'm going for. So my third option, it's the old skill in the bottle, Nuln Oil Shade Paint. I use this stuff on the M3 Lee uh, as a spot wash in all the rivets and welds and seams, and it did a fantastic job. And... Yeah, it's looking alright. Just got a little bit more on, make sure I've got plenty of it in all the cracks and crevices. Not that there are many of them, it's a small rock, that's why I'm using it for testing purposes. But yeah, I think that will actually do. Get some of that slapped over all of the other rocks. Kind of looks like a, a chalk outcrop. And I'm happy with that. Next thing I want to do is try to add some definition to the muddy tracks that you can see hopefully. Although, well, that's kind of the point. You can't really see them that well. Uh, there are all kinds of tyre tracks and tank track tracks uh, running through the muddy surface. But you don't really see them very well, so I'm going to bring them out with a bit of that Gore Grunter contrast paint. It's a very dark brown. So, if you think about it, if, if you imagine a muddy lane, the parts where most vehicle traffic has actually been in contact with the surface. Where the actual tracks are, they've been depressed further into the ground. And that's where the water is. So it's going to look darker because it's wetter. And that's the effect I'm trying to go for here. In fact, I might even add some water. I've got some Vallejo still water resin. So the deepest part of the ruts in the road there, I might actually put some water in. Um, I won't need to colour it because it's going to be a very, very thin layer and there's a very dark brown paint underneath it. Or at least, that's the theory. And there it is. It doesn't look too bad, actually. You know, considering I'm making this all up as I go along, I think I've gotten off quite lightly. This, this could easily have turned into an utter disaster. So what are we going to do next? Well, I don't know about you, but it's all looking a bit, well, brown really, isn't it? So why don't we add some grass? I've got this stuff from Worldwide Scenics, I think they're called. The pack of 12 different types of static grass. Technically, it's just four different types of static grass. Spring, summer, autumn and winter, but in three different lengths. Two, four and I think six millimetres. I think the winter stuff might be more appropriate, but it's kind of brown as well. So we're going to go for this stuff. Autumn, 4mm. What's static grass jingles? This stuff is amazing. Here's how it works. You're going to need one of these static grass applic- oh, wrong way round, hang on. There we go. There's a 9 volt battery in there. You see the crocodile clip on the other end? That gets attached to the scenery, and it just runs a very, very low charge through it. It's a very low current, don't worry, you're not going to do any damage to yourself or anything else that touches it. You load the applicator up with a grass, 
The first thing you're going to do, of course, is apply some sort of glue to the surface to give the grass something to stick to. So I'm using this layering spray adhesive. It's just a mix of PDA glue and water. I bought this because it comes with a spray bottle, and once I've used it all up, I'll just be mixing my own up with 50% PDA, 50% water. Now, when you spray it down, it does look pretty horrible, but this stuff, when it dries, it turns transparent. So, slap some of this sprayed glue down on the area that you want to coat with your grass. Then, you take your static grass applicator, load it up with your grass of choice, switch it on, attach the crocodile clip to the area of the model that you're going to coat, and then just shake the static grass from the applicator all over the area that you want covered in grass. And because there's a static charge running through it, the grass will stand upright. That's what makes this so different from just dusting the surface in coloured modelling flock. It actually looks like grass. Next, I'm going to take some of these grass tufts. They're self-adhesive, but I'm going to get them down while the glue is still wet. And these are exactly the same things that I apply to the bases of my Imperial Guardsmen to add a bit of life to the bases. And I'm going to stick these around the bases of the rocks. While I was doing this, it did occur to me that I had made a bit of an error when it came to applying the grass. Because I didn't put any masks on the rocks, so the grass is on the rocks as well as around them. So, like I said, never done this before. It's all a bit of a learning process. That's something to remember going forward for the next time I do this. Get some masking tape down over the rocks so that the grass goes around the rocks and not on them. As it is, I had to clean them up with a scenery brush. Uh, which ended up with the scenery brush being covered in glue and static grass, and that took a long time to clean. Um, but, lesson learned, I'll remember not to do that next time. Grass tufts are all applied, now I'm going to add a bit of extra surface texture around the base of the rocks, where the glue is still wet over there. Mostly just to put something else down on the diorama that isn't rock, mud, or grass. Yes, I know it's just another shade of brown. There are already a lot of browns on this diorama, but it's very muddy. Um, if you're going to apply anything to it, you have to make sure it matches what's already there. So yeah, it's another shade of brown, but it's a different shade of brown. It's also a different texture. So the theory is, it will help to add a bit of variety, but without looking out of place. The last thing that I want to do before I add the actual models to the diorama is get some water into those deep tracks where all the ruts are in the muddy surface so I'm adding some of this Vallejo still water texture and that's going in the deepest part of the tracks in the mud. My trials and tribulations when it came to assembling and painting the various different uh, crew members that are going onto this diorama weren't quite finished. When I took them outside on the spray stick to varnish them up to remove the shine and give them a nice matte finish one of them fell off and landed on a concrete slab head first and the head went flying into the garden grass and I never found it again so suddenly I'm down to just four of the five crew and this of course was the crewman who was actually sitting on the tank and looked most different from all of the others. To say that I was more than a little pissed off would have been something of an understatement but I was able to salvage the situation. Do you remember the additional crewman, the one that actually came with the model? The one whose legs I had to cut off at the knees in order to fit him into the turret? Well, his head made an excellent replacement. <laughs> it needed repainting, but it got the job done. And the finished result, while far from perfect, it isn't too bad. I had a lot of fun doing it. I learned a lot doing it. And I'm looking forward to taking the lessons that I learned and applying them the next time I do something like this. Not quite sure what I'm going to do next. In fact, there's an idea. Why don't I make a poll? I'll put the link to it down below in the video description and you guys can vote on what it is that I do next. Might not be able to get it done in time for next week. In fact, I almost certainly won't be able to get it done in time for next week, but you never know your luck. Maybe next week we'll have something different on Wednesday. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly learned a lot from the process of constructing this diorama. And hopefully some of you guys learned something too and were maybe inspired to try something for yourself. I hope you enjoyed the video. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.